Hey there students, thanks for joining me for the first lecture in my U.S. History course. And in this bit, we're going to talk about Native American cultures from 1491 to 1607. These being symbolic years, 1491 symbolizing pre-contact Native Americans and 1607 being the first permanent English settlement at Jamestown. So really looking at Native Americans at the time of the European contact and shortly after before the foundation of English permanent settlements. And I have a couple of objectives today. First of all, we need to realize that there were several different Indian populations in the present day United States. And secondly, that each of these tribal groups lived a lifestyle in accordance with its environment. So keep in mind, there is not just one prototype Native American. There are several different diverse cultural groups. And as a uh, you can see here we have 156 distinct ethnic groups in the Americas, of which 50 or so were in the continental United States. Thank you to Terry at Knowledge Quest Maps for letting me use this stuff. And luckily for you, you are not going to have to learn all 50 of these different distinct cultural groups, but you need to realize that each of these groups fits into one of the larger cultural groups in North America, of which there are about 10. I'm going to take a closer look at about five. And each of these areas has a distinct sort of culture about it based on the environment in that area. As you go up north into modern day Canada and Alaska, you're going to see tribes that subsist exclusively on hunting and fishing and gathering what they can in a climate that's not very hospitable to agriculture. And as you go south, you're going to see a lot more farming. You're going to still see hunting and gathering and some fishing, but not as exclusive as you see up north. And of course you can see here when you go down to the southwest and the southeast you see a good deal more farming. And we're going to look at five different American Indian culture groups. The Arctic, the Plains, the Northeast and Great Lakes, the Southwest and the Southeast. And just take a quick look at what makes each of them unique. So the Arctic Indians, we're talking about Eskimos, Inuits, uh, these people who live in these Arctic regions of Alaska and Canada who lived about exclusively from hunting, gathering and fishing. And you can see here an Eskimo seal hunter. Seals are plentiful out there and they are a source of meat, a source of fat, a source of protein. These Indians ate a diet that was 75% fat. Now if somebody eats that kind of diet in the south, that'll kill them, which a lot of people in the south do eat diets like that. But that's not good if you live in a warm climate like I do. But when you go up there, you're burning so many calories just to exist that that works that you can eat a diet that would kill somebody in a more temperate climate so their lifestyle is a lot different than the Indians you're gonna see in the southeast and in the southwest and let's go on to the Plains region now the Plains Indians are marked by the bison hunt they are migratory because they follow the herds of bison and they ride horses. Now keep in mind that horses were introduced by the Europeans. Before European contact there weren't horses. So this is a way that the European contact actually defined a lifestyle that was based on following these buffalo herds and hunting them on horseback. You see this uh, Indian here is about to kill this bison with a bow and arrow and these guys, Geronimo, about to run some bison off of a cliff. Now in case you're wondering, yes, I do know that Geronimo was not a Plains Indian. He was a Southwestern Apache Indian, but it just fit there with them jumping off a cliff. And keep in mind that these Plains Indians lived a very nomadic lifestyle that because they followed the buffalo, they did not tend to live in settled communities. But of course, even within the Plains region, this was not always the case. You had the Wichita tribe, which lived a lifestyle more based on agriculture because these nomads had to have a source of fiber 
All right, you're not going to just eat meat all the time. You want to supplement that with grains and vegetables and that sort of thing. And so these tribes that subsisted on bison hunting, they would go and trade with the Wichita tribe, such as the Comanche and other people nearby. They would go to the Wichita tribe. They'd trade uh, buffalo uh, meat and buffalo skins and all of that kind of stuff. And the Wichita would trade agricultural products. So even there, you're going to see some settled agriculture and settled communities. Let's go to the Northeast where you're still going to see some hunting and gathering, but you're also going to see a lot of what we would call slash and burn agriculture that is not based on having permanent fields, but really just kind of rotating around here and there and planning things very simply just in the environment there. And then after a few years, after the soil becomes exhausted, you move on and you let nature replenish it. And maybe you'll go back there in another 20 years. And the planting of crops there was based on the three sisters, corn, squash, and beans. And I'll talk a bit about Iroquois longhouses. So these three sisters, you can see here that somebody is experimenting with Native American agriculture. And the three sisters, corn, squash, and beans. Now, I'm no scientist. I don't know all of the ins and outs here, all of the what have you and everything. But I do know that these crops can all be planted really kind of on top of each other. And they each will replenish each other. So corn, squash, and beans, and they're not really planted in rows. They're just kind of planted uh, where they can be planted. So these were the primary crops that were planted by Native Americans, not only in the Northeast, but in other parts of the country as well. And you can see here the three sisters being commemorated on the back of a United States dollar coin. Now note here that there is a woman doing the planning, which brings us uh, briefly to Native American gender roles. And men would typically do the hunting and women would do the gathering and the bulk of the farming. So gender roles were defined by Native American cultures and Europeans were kind of taken aback because keep in mind that Europeans had a system of farming that was done by men and they didn't really hunt because they had cows and sheep, livestock, that sort of thing. And so there were some misunderstandings. The Europeans thought that Indian men were lazy, that they overworked their women, which this was just, okay, well, the Europeans had gender roles and the Indians had gender roles, and they were just different. And the Iroquois lived in longhouses. These were multifamily dwellings uh, where you could fit a lot of people in here. You build a fire. You can keep warm in the winter. And this longhouse was the typical dwelling. You didn't have single family dwellings uh, among these northeastern Indian tribes. And the Iroquois are distinct because of the league or confederation that they formed. Once again, thanks to Knowledge Quest Maps for providing me with this. And you can see the Iroquois, you had five or six tribes, depending on whether you're looking at it before or after uh, the last tribe was introduced. And these tribes all maintained their tribal identity, but they made a permanent alliance with each other. And this kind of foreshadows what's going to happen with the states later on. And these tribes, you're still a Mohawk or a Seneca or an Oneida, but you have pledged peace with each other. And they saw each other as living in a sort of longhouse. They used the longhouse as kind of an allegory for what they were doing, that we are several families living in a house together. Now, why would they form this confederation? Well, because there was a great deal of intertribal warfare. They already were fighting against their enemies, the Algonquins, across the Great Lakes, and they weren't going to be able to survive if they also kept fighting each other. And here in the middle, you can see a European. So you see that Europeans are getting involved in these intertribal conflicts, and different tribes are going to take sides with different groups of Europeans.
Moving on to the Southwest, where people are a little more settled, living in clay houses and cliff dwellings because they practice maize or corn agriculture. Uh, that's most of what they grow and eat. So they tend to live in one place. You can see this is a Hopi apartment complex, basically. This is not a large dwelling like a longhouse. This is a multifamily dwelling, but it's divided into several apartments. And you see that there are some ladders there. You see that it's fortified. You don't see doors right there on the outside. So lots of people can live in a very enclosed area and defend themselves from attacks by outsiders very easily. Now, once again, you see cliff dwellings, which have the advantage of also being defensible. You see where some of these can't be accessed by somebody that's coming in. And the most famous of the cliff dwellings would be the Cliff Palace in Mesa Verde National Park. Very, very elaborate. Definitely a place I would like to go sometime. And finally, let's go to the Southeast. Now in the Southeast, we're also looking at settled communities whose lifestyles were based on agriculture and a specific type of culture that existed pre-contact was the Mississippian culture and this was uh, you know the biggest Mississippian settlement was at a place called Cahokia that's across from St. Louis and these Mississippian settlements are characterized by Indian mounds this is not a naturally occurring hill this is a mound that was built by Indians and if you're going to build a mound that's that huge you're planning on staying there a little while they've reconstructed what Cahokia and other Mississippian settlements may have looked like and as you can see there's a market here and across the river you see houses you see walls around a city you see these mounds you see that these people were there uh, Cahokia may have housed thousands of people in the city and its vicinity so we also tend to think about Native Americans as being in small groups going from place to place being nomadic in some cases that's true but in other cases it's not keep in mind there are also as you go south the Aztecs the Maya the Inca who lived in larger communities and in some cases built great empires so every one of these Native American culture groups is different so for those of you who want a little review or those of you who just want to copy down the notes, maybe I was a little bit too fast for you, you can press the pause button and do that, or you can listen to me summarize it, or both. So first of all, we've got the Arctic Indians, who are subsisting nearly exclusively on hunting, gathering, and fishing in a climate that is not suited for agriculture. Then the Plains Indians, who hunt buffalo primarily and are using the buffalo for you know their their houses their food really for everything you go to the northeast and the great lakes and you still see some hunting and gathering but also slash and burn agriculture which is based on the cultivation of the three sisters corn squash and beans and remember the Iroquois longhouses and this sort of allegory of the Iroquois living not only in large family groups inside of a large house, but also living in this intertribal, peaceful confederation. Then we look at the Southwest, we see clay houses and cliff dwellings and people who practice maize agriculture. And then finally in the Southeast, more agriculture, more settled communities, specifically this Mississippian culture with its ruins at Cahokia and these mounds that there are several of them across the South. So that's about it for that. I'm going to continue with U.S. history, so if you want to follow me along, make sure that you subscribe to my channel. Visit TomRitchie.net, my website. I've got all kinds of stuff there. If you want the slides from today or graphic organizers or notes or anything like that, visit my website. I also do some tutoring and grading if you're interested in that. Twitter, Instagram, at Tom Ritchie. I'm also on Facebook. Respond to this. Comment if it helped you. Like, dislike. I hope to see you again sometime. But for now, I'm out. Until next time.